Okay, good evening. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to, to introduce you tonight, tonight uh, Dr. Robert Zieger, uh, uh, and he will be talking about the, uh, 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 he will be giving a lecture entitled, Does America Still Need Unions? And Robert uh, H. Zieger is Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus, University of Florida. He is the author, uh, among other books, of uh, American Workers, American Unions, uh, The CIO, 1935-1955, and For Jobs and Freedom, Race and Labor in America Since 1865. He has twice been the recipient of the Philip A. Taft Prize for the best book in American labor history. He has taught at Kansas State University, the University of Wisconsin, Wayne State University, and the University of Utrecht, as well as at the University of Florida. And uh, we are really delighted to have uh, a person, a scholar of his caliber, and also someone who cares deeply about American labor give this lecture tonight. So help me welcome Professor Zieger. Uh, my topic is, um, does America still need unions? The word still uh, is in parentheses for reasons that will be perhaps clear a little later. Uh, and I have to give you a full disclosure here. Uh, well, first to say, that's one question I'm going to ask. And the other question is, what, if anything, does the historical record contribute to understanding the problems and challenges facing today's workers and today's unions. So there's a two-part kind of question. So the first question, does America still need unions? And the answer is a resounding yes, as I put on my labor organization cap. This is from the Service Employees Union. Yes, America still does need unions. Now, full disclosure, I'm a member of a union, the United Faculty of Florida, which is affiliated with the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers, and hence with the AFL-CIO. And I'm the secretary of the North Central Florida Central Labor Council in Gainesville, Florida. So I speak uh, partly as a partisan. At the same time, I speak as well as, I hope, a scholar, a historian, uh, hence the letter H, not Harvard, but rather historian. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm aware that n not everyone will agree with the answer I gave. In fact, there is a popular and scholarly literature that depicts organized labor as at best self-serving and high-handed, and at worst literally counterproductive and obstructive. Uh, legal historian Paul Marino says this, everyone suffers from labor unionization because in his view, unions restrict production, distort compensation patterns, and impede innovation. Economists Richard Vedder and Lowell Galloway conclude that over the past century, labor unions have reduced US output by trillions of dollars. Uh, even liberal TV host Bill Maher holds teachers unions responsible for the problems of the public schools, a view widely publicized in the much ballyhooed documentary film Waiting for Superman. Such views, you can be sure, do not go uncontested, and indeed, uh, a never-ending but always changing debate continues to rage among legal scholars, historians, polemicists, and economists about the roles of unions, how they have played, and what role they continue to play in the United States. And it's not my intention here to address this issue directly. You may want to do it somewhat in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Q&A. My own premise in this talk is that, yes, America, uh, I guess I should have showed a different hat. Yes, America does need unions. My premise is that a strong, autonomous, and energetic labor movement is a necessary component of a healthy democratic society. In saying this, I stress really four points. One would be organized labor's role in, um, I'm trying to find my little thing here, uh, organized labor's role in moderating inequality and in setting standards for workers' compensation, occupational safety. Oh, this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got the, this was the slide I should have shown in the last paragraph, I apologize for that. Uh, uh, workers' compensation, occupational safety, and workplace treatment. This is, uh, uh, sl the slide depicts, the, the slides depict the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire of 1911 in which 147 young women locked in the upper floor of a burning building burned to death or left to their death holding hands. Uh, and uh, 
uh, labor unions have been instrumental, I believe, in um, ameliorating some of these conditions. So that's one. Uh, secondly, I think there is a need for a clear and articulate voice for working people and for lower income citizens in debates over such issues as social security, taxation, economic policy, education, and imposing alternatives to corporate dominated public discourse about the values we should be uh, seeking, uh, the kinds of human rights we should be stressing, and basically about the civic identity of the American people. The third point would be, I think organized labor has played, uh, particularly in recent decades, uh, a very positive role in encouraging cooperation and amity and in combating racism, ethnocentrism, sexism, xenophobia in an increasingly diverse labor force. This is a poster from the 1963 March on Washington, uh, which I attended and I picked it up on my way back to the car thinking, I'll be teaching labor history, I can make use of this poster someday. Fast forward a few years. Uh, and finally, uh, point four, labor's role in bringing a modicum of democracy to the most authoritarian venue in American life, the workplace. You'll recognize some of the figures here. Certainly, uh, Montgomery Burns uh, stands out. Uh, whether you agree with these points or not, and uh, I think everyone would agree that the current state of the labor movement uh, is, uh, is of a movement very much in trouble. The facts and figures about organized labor's current status in American life are very clear. Um, there has been a 40 year or more decline in membership. I should have had my scholar's hat on. This is factual material. Uh, 40 year decline in membership. Uh, and I think I have a slide for that. This shows a 30 odd year decline in membership, the red line. Right now, something under 14% of American workers are represented by unions, about 7% in the private economy. Uh, public employees uh, have about a 37% union rate. There was a 10% drop off in union membership in 2009, not surprising in view of the uh, recession and the rise in unemployment. Observes journalist Stephen Greenhouse of the New York Times, even some labor leaders agree, quote, that American unions seem to be sliding toward irrelevance and oblivion. Uh, reasons for this decline. There are the usual suspects. Um, many reasons have been adduced. I don't really mean to distinguish between them. They're all the subject of, again, fierce debate among scholars, among activists, uh, uh, but here more to list them. One, of course, would be obviously the decline in manufacturing. The United States in the first decade of the 21st century has lost over 7 million manufacturing jobs. Today, only about 10% of the American labor force is employed in manufacturing. We don't make things anymore. Um, the deregulation of sectors of the economy in the 1970s and 1980s uh, cut the ground from under unions in trucking, uh, air transport, and other sectors of the economy. Um, the, uh, uh, there, there has been a growing over the past 30 years uh, direct attack on organized labor by very powerful and influential uh, business groups. Many people date the most intense phase of this to the early 1980s with the strike, uh, the, the defeat of the strike of the air traffic controllers in 1981. And some people link that with a, a very bitter copper workers, steel workers strike in Arizona around the same time as signal events that kind of signal to corporate America, uh, unions are vulnerable, it's time to go after them tooth and nail. And uh, that certainly has been the case. But of course, economic factors such as global competition, um, uh, ending the US competitive advantage that emerged from World War II, the complacency and unresponsiveness of labor leadership. George Meany, the then aging head of the AFL-CIO, uh, he finally relinquished the reins of power at age 90 in 1980. Uh, in the, one of his last uh, statements during his last decade in power when people said the labor movement is losing membership he said if workers are not smart enough to join unions we shouldn't be worried about them and um, this was um, uh, not a very wise thing to say to say the least um, it is true that organized labor's decline in the united states is part of a more general phenomenon 
uh, that is in most Western industrialized countries, peaks of union membership have declined over the past 30 years or so, but it has been more precipitous here, owing in part, I think at least, to the intensity and the resourcefulness of corporate hostility. For example, um, I taught in the Netherlands uh, back in 2002, and I was shocked to see on the English language page on Dutch affairs of the International uh, Herald Tribune, uh, the head of the Employers Association in the Netherlands saying, uh, decrying the fact that young workers weren't as interested in the union, didn't join or didn't participate in the union. We need the unions, he said, because we need to have somebody to talk to as employers. That's a very foreign uh, idea for American employers. Um, and uh, although it is true that there have been declines throughout the Western world, uh, uh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I got to go. Uh, I'll do this one because I was I'm sorry. I'm a little confused on the uh, slides. This shows the um, pattern of union membership in the United States and that country closest to us in most of its industrial characteristics. You see the drop in union membership between 1960 and 2000 from over 30 percent to under 15 percent, whereas in Canada, uh, uh, the uh, uh, line has been pretty much straightforward, a little bit of a peak around 1980, but uh, hovering in the, uh, mid in the mid 30s. So it's uh, not, it's, it is an international phenomenon, but it is also a distinctly American phenomenon. I want to go back to this because a point I didn't mention and I would add to it is the um, changing pattern of labor law, U.S. labor law dating back to the 1930s the Wagner or National Labor Relations Act, as I'll quote later on, uh, was designed to encourage union formation, to encourage collective bargaining. Uh, most unionists today regard it as an impediment to collective bargaining and to union formation. These are a couple of obviously pro-union cartoons pointing to the way in which labor law uh, disadvantages those seeking to join, uh, to join unions. But here's some a point that I do want to make. I mean, and having made these points, uh, I wanted to show you this, uh, this uh, uh, image as well. When we're talking about the decline of organized labor in American life, and it's a very real phenomenon, look at the membership of some of the organizations perhaps that some members of this audience will have belonged to. The American Civil Liberties Union, for example, 275,000 members. Now, the NAACP, the Sierra Club, half million apiece. The NRA, about maybe three and a half million. Now, these uh, statistics are a little dated. The AFL-CIO and other unions that are not affiliated with the AFL-CIO, 14.7 million members. So it is still, the labor movement is still a powerful force in many ways, a numerous force. In my own state of Florida, which is a so-called right to work state, uh, uh, and has a very hostile climate vis-a-vis -vis labor organization, there are still 400,000 union members in Florida. Um, so it, it, it's uh, uh, reports of the death of the labor movement, I think, have been exaggerated. It's in trouble. It's in a lot of trouble. But it's still a large body of Americans uh, who need to be taken seriously. Uh, yeah, I can keep this on. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so now I want to take a look at the past. That's where I'm most comfortable. I am a historian, of course. Um, and I've titled this section of my talk, The Uses of the Past, the idea being that perhaps if we agree, if only for the sake of argument, that a, revitali a revitalization of the labor movement is something to be desired, uh, some understanding of its historical development in America might be helpful. The historian has to believe that. Um, or otherwise, I guess, he or she would stop being a historian. Imagine then my dismay when I read just last week the words of AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka. He was uh, giving a blurb for a book that was entitled a new, a, a new New Deal for Labor. It's about how the labor new movement needs to reinvent itself. Trumka said this, at a time when America desperately needs stronger unions, this book sends a clear message that nostalgia for organized labor's past is no strategy for the future. And I thought, Trumka, you're cutting the ground from under me. But uh, uh, maybe we can reconcile these views. Undaunted by uh, Trumka's words, however, and ever the historian, I do believe there is some value in looking at the period of sustained union success, what economist Paul Krugman calls the golden age of the American economy, 
i.e. roughly between around 1940 and 1973, especially with regard to wage earnings. And um, this just depicts some of the major collective bargaining gains of the sort of signature union of this period, the United Auto Workers, once a powerful force of about 1.7 million members, now under 400,000 members with the shrinkage of the automobile industry. This is another, this is, I love this slide. It shows what a typical American family of an industrial worker, this guy worked in a, uh, ostensibly worked in a chemical plant in Cleveland, it's I think 1953, and it shows the bounty of the American economy and the prosperity of the American working class in the post-World War II decades. Um, it, during this period, that is the 1940s and 1950s, you see the distribution of income downward into the wa wage earning class, which underwrote the booming prosperity of the 1950s and 60s. During these years, income was more evenly distributed than during what Krugman calls the long gilded age, the period from roughly 1870 to 1933, and more evenly distributed than it has been in the United States since the late 1970s. It was a period of union growth starting in the 1930s, and strong unions played a role in shaping public policy and in pressing the claims of wa wage earners, both in the economy and in the political arena. Krugman says this, everything we know about unions says that their new power was a major factor in the creation of a post-war middle-class society. There are some facts and figures here to note. Um, uh, uh, during this period, the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, was a period of substantial union growth. Union membership in 1933 stood at under 10%, just as it is in the private economy today. By 19, oh, by 1950, it had expanded to uh, a third of the labor force, uh, of uh, the non-agricultural labor force. There was mar a period marked by the expansion of unions into new sectors of the economy. Before the 1930s, the auto industry, the steel industry, mass production industry in general had um, uh, not been unionized. In the 1930s and 40s, uh, union strength grew, led by unions such as the United Auto Workers and the United Steel Workers. It was during this period that unions made their greatest collective bargaining gains, pensions, health, uh, health care insurance, um, Vacations, vacations were very rare among the American labor force before the 1940s. Uh, the, creation, uh, the creation of a potent political arm, first by the CIO or the Congress of Industrial Organizations in 1943, and then followed later by the American Federation of Labor, and subsequently by the AFL-CIO, which merged the two in 1955. The reasons for this success during this period not necessarily in order of importance, which is the subject of another fierce debate among historians of which of these factors. One factor I think of great importance was industrial structure. This was the classic age of American industry. These are two views of the Ford River Rouge plant where 80,000 workers produced Fords and during World War II military equipment. Um, the, the targets of organization were relatively centralized and integrated. You could bring collective bargaining to General Motors, a mighty and anti-labor, excuse me, anti-union uh, corporation by tying up their production in the single small Michigan city of Flint, Michigan in 1936-37. Uh, so uh, th there were uh, the industrial structure of the country and the key industries that were under organization were highly centralized and very susceptible to creative forms of organization. Uh, it's a period also in which marked by inspired leadership, probably the most dynamic and uh, uh, bigger than life figure in the labor movement and in American life generally, except for Franklin Roosevelt himself in the 30s and 40s was John L. Lewis. And you see a couple of depictions of Lewis uh, in the bottom picture. He's emerging from a terrible coal mining disaster in Centralia, Illinois. Lewis was the founder of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO that brought organization to the mass production industries of the country. Keep this image of uh, Lewis in mind, if you will, or keep it in your mind. I won't come back to it, but I'm going to invoke it again. 
uh, another leading figure from this period, a name that will be familiar to some people in the audience, Walter Ruther, the young man standing up uh, as a young man. Ruther became president of the Auto Workers Union in 1940, uh, 1946 and remained so until his death in a plane crash in 1970. He was known as, Lewis was known for his histrionics, for his uh, rhetoric, for his Shakespearean denunciation of the foes of the working class. Uh, Ruther was known more, although he was a very able speaker, he was known more for his innovative approaches to collective bargaining and to the assertion of union rights here in the bottom picture. He's uh, making the claim, these uh, striking auto workers, uh, that workers should have something to say about how the company establishes its goals and how it conducts its production processes. Workers know this better than employers in many ways, asserting claims that in fact were not realized but were very creatively put forth by Ruther. I thought just take a break for, uh, and oh, the, and the other leading figure of this period I would point to, not so much for his actual labor activities, although he was president of a union, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, was A. Philip Randolph. I include Randolph in this period because of his role in pressing the claims of African American workers and his forcing the government during World War II to begin to respond to the claims of uh, justice for black workers through the, uh, through the direct action of the federal government. Um, I have some other more contemporary labor leaders. This is sort of a little segue just to kind of make com comparisons and contrasts. And I put this one, I didn't know if I should keep this in or not. This is a, a magazine cover from a couple of years ago, uh, Can This Man Save Labor? Those of you uh, knowledgeable or following the news know that uh, Andy Stern just stepped down last year as president of the Service Employees Union, and uh, I don't think he's going to save labor. He's no longer the leader of the one of the largest unions in the AFL-CIO. Uh, but these are the leaders of the current labor movement, and their names are worth uh, keeping in mind. On your what your your right, yeah. On your right, John Wilhelm, the man with the boycott um, uh, sign on his chest. He's the head of the uh, Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union, which is one of the more imaginative and creative organizations. And in front of him is Richard Trumka of the AFL-CIO. Both of these are highly educated individuals. Trumka has a law degree, and uh, uh, Wilhelm is a graduate of Yale University. On the left is Mary Kay Henry, the president of the Service Employees International Union. Now, I think, the biggest or second biggest uh, union in the AFL-CIO with over a million members. Um, uh, Mary Kay Henry is, uh, uh, has, it's, I think, fair to mention because she has mentioned it very prominently herself. Uh, she has proudly announced her lesbian identity, and I'm asking you to compare and contrast this image of a new labor leader in the post-industrial post age with the grizzled images of labor leaders of the 1930s and 1940s. Um, so industrial structure, inspired leadership uh, of the time, um, rank and file activism and militancy. And I've got a couple of slides. Uh, probably if you take an American history survey course someplace, you've seen things like this. On the bottom is the Minneapolis trucker strike, a violent confrontation, 1934. Uh, the top slide is uh, striking textile workers in a southern mill, shaming to what they would call scabs who are breaking the picket line to go to work. Uh, these are scenes from organizing Ford Motor Company. These are all, uh, when I was mentioning doing this talk um, uh, to a colleague who teaches political science and he's a political theorist and far removed from labor history, he said, you know, I was, uh, uh, I got my bachelor's degree at Cornell in the industrial and labor relations program and I took labor history courses and I found the tales, you've got to tell these people of these great tales of labor organization and militant activism and the violence that took place. These are exciting, dynamic parts of American history. Um, so I said, okay, I will. And so here are some of those scenes. This is a famous, um, oh, where's the, hmm. Anyhow, upper, on the upper left is a famous scene from the so-called Battle of the Overpass, UAW organizers attempting to pass out leaflets to Ford workers, uh, urging them to join the union and support the cause being beaten up by uh, Ford's notorious service department, consisting largely of former criminals on parole to Ford 
uh, to enforce uh, discipline in the workplace. Um, the other two have to do with the successful organization of Ford in 1941, likening Henry Ford and his repressive regime in the auto plants to Adolf Hitler, a favorite whipping boy of uh, American Unionists in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and this is a scene, again, just redolent of the 1930s, the Re Republic Steel Massacre of Memorial Day, 1937. 11 steel, striking steel workers uh, shot to death by the Chicago police. These were uh, scenes of militancy, activism. I don't mean to equate militancy with violence, but it's part of the heritage coming out of the 1930s. And this may be what Trumpka had in mind in saying, let's not get hung up in the nostalgia of the past, but these are part of the record of American labor history. Uh, and another very powerful and I think uh, critical factor, whoops, yeah, there it is, uh, accounting for the success of labor during this period was on the political realm. Um, uh, a president who was sympathetic to organized labor. It, it's sort of interesting with FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, friend of the union, um, union organizers go out in 1933 and 34 and say to workers, the president wants you to join a union. If pressed, they would have said, yeah, President John L. Lewis wants you to join the Mine Workers Union. Uh, but the implication was your friend in the White House, Franklin D. Roosevelt, wants you to join the union because government policies were um, becoming somewhat more favorable to labor organizations. In general, I think the people in the labor movement created the FDR that they wanted to create. They wanted to create a staunch friend of labor organization and to enlist him on their side. In actual practice, uh, Louis, uh, uh, FDR was actually a lot more ambivalent about the need for unions and some of the activities associated with unions, but uh, certainly there was the widespread feeling, and it wasn't a wrong feeling, that the government was positive toward labor union growth. And um, this man, Senator Robert Wagner of New York, author of the National Labor Relations Act, which validated the idea of labor organization as a key uh, device for ending the Great Depression. This positive attitude of government la really lasted. I mean, it's not unambiguous. Uh, it's not like uh, the government was uh, in the pockets of the unions or anything like that. But in general, through the World War II period, there was a strong uh, symbiosis between government and organized labor uh, as represented primarily through FDR. There were setbacks in 1947. Congress passed a law, the Taft-Hartley Act, that amended the National Labor Relations Act and put new restrictions on unions. But even so, through the 1950s, there was generally the recognized the idea that organized labor representing, as it did over a third of the non-agricultural labor force, was a legitimate and positive force in American life. See if you can identify the author of this quiz, No Fair, You Know Who It Is. Um, uh, it's from the 1950s. Unions have a secure place in our industrial life. Only a handful of reactionaries harbor the ugly thought of breaking unions and depriving working men and women of the right to join the union of their choice. Who was that radical who said that? Who said that? You got it, Dwight Eisenhower. You win some kind of prize that Anwar will uh, award to you after. Uh, was that was that the ten thousand dollar prize? That we're doing? I, I, something like that. You work it out with him, okay? Yeah, I mean here's even Eisenhower, who's a conservative Republican and certainly skeptical of some of the activities of the union, but still a pretty uh, forthright statement that really uh, even conservatives, even Republicans. Uh, were recognized the legitimacy and value of uh, organized labor. Um, another factor, I think, that or, or, or point uh, with regard to the success of the labor movement in this so-called golden age uh, was its ability to bridge, to some extent, the racial slash ethnic uh, divisions among the industrial working class. Uh, many of the workers in the steel mills and the auto plants and the other mass production industries had come out of the so-called new immigrant background. The immigrants who had come to the United States in the early years of the 20th century, in many cases they were the children of this uh, immigrant background, and the CIO in particularly, the Industrial Union Federation, was able to bring a diverse labor force together into a common cause. 
and in fact to break some of the more racially exclusive traditions of the older labor movement and to incorporate African Americans and to make alliances with the NAACP and African American groups. Uh, A. Philip Randolph, who I showed you earlier, was a primary champion of that view. And then finally, and I think in a, in a general sort of sense, um, labor was successful in this period because, well, uh, maybe it's just sort of redundant, arguing in circles, but uh, uh, there was a broad sense that business ideology wasn't paying off. During the 1920s, corporate America had said, trust us, don't join unions, don't cause trouble, don't go out on strike, we'll bring you prosperity, you can buy automobiles, you can go to the movies, you can have radios, you can have a secure life. The bottom drops out in 1929, 1930, 31, and American workers basically say, not in one single voice, but as a movement, we need a new deal. Uh, that deal isn't working. And this deal involves using government as a positive force in shaping the economy and in shaping the society, and we need our own uh, instruments of uh, defense and, and assertion, i.e., an industrial union movement. I think I'm back now. Uh, uh, all right, now <laughs> I had the only I could find this old SEIU hat is the only one I could find that was quite appropriate. Uh, that was then. Can the labor movement once again become a force for a more egalitarian and worker-friendly society? Uh, of what relevance, if any, is the story of the labor movement's successes in the so-called golden age to the problems and prospects of today's workers? Uh, and, and I wear this hat for two reasons now. Uh, the historian's hat is something I feel more comfortable with this one in the sense that I kind of know the history. Uh, I'm not always sure that the fast-changing uh, world of today that um, I feel as confident about uh, being on top of, not just as a person, but really uh, uh, as, as a citizen as well. Comparisons between then and now are tricky. Probably the most important difference is that then most workers actually made things and employers relied on them to generate production and to generate profits. Today, corporate bottom lines and stock prices are associated with shedding workers, both in production and in management as well. The chief, of, uh, the chief financial officer of Alcoa, a uh, company that was in recession in 2007 and 2008, uh, laid off 37,000 of its employee, uh, employees um, as the company begins to improve its position, pay better dividends, and so on. The, the chief financial officer promises his stockholders, we're not only holding down headcount levels, but we are striving, we are, we are also, but are also driving restructuring further that will result in further reduction. We don't want these workers back. They're superfluous to us. Profits depend on getting rid of workers, or at least getting rid of American workers. And there are, of course, other factors as well um, that uh, make comparisons difficult. Um, American workers in the 1920s didn't have to worry a lot, or in the 40s, and, excuse me, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, didn't have to worry about globalization. They didn't have to worry about outsourcing. Uh, certainly, American workers today must worry about these things. Can you see those cartoons? Okay, can you read the captions? I thought they were particularly apropos. Grandpa, what was manufacturing? Uh, we used to. George Meany, who I quoted detrimentally before, but Meany did say as this process was beginning way back, even as early as the 70s, uh, when someone said, uh, well, we don't need to manufacture anymore. We have a financial sector, we have a service sector. Meany said, what are we gonna end up doing? Shining each other's shoes? Is that, you know, the way the American economy was going? Um, and uh, uh, American business, of course, has been substituting low-wage offshore workers. There's even a sitcom about it now, outsourced uh, for high-wage uh, workers. Uh, temporary, just-in-time employees for permanent full-time employees. Contract workers uh, for payroll workers. For today's workers, the notion of full-time, lifetime employment with defined benefit pensions, one thought, once thought to be the proud American standard, is uh, but a distant memory. I'm going to quote here a management scholar, Peter Capelli, in his book, A New Deal at Work, published in, eight, in 99, uh, but very apropos. Employers broke the old, uh, have broken, I think I should use that uh, change of 
employers have broken the old deal, which involved job security, more or less lifetime employment, because they didn't want long-term commitments. But increasingly, they don't want employees at all. He adds that the happy worker model of employee behavior was a basic tenet of business school coursework when I went to college back in the 50s and 60s. It said that the best way to keep workers productive was to keep them happy, that satisfied and committed employees were the key to company performance. While it is difficult for many of us of that generation to admit, that model more or less went out the window in the 1980s and has been replaced by what, me, what might be called the frightened worker model. The new model employment has pay, uh, structure has paid off in important respects. Uh, productivity has grown substantially over the past quarter century. Share prices, uh, at least at one point, had risen to dizzying heights and may be climbing in, in the wake of the Republican victory. I don't know. Uh, may be climbing back up there again. Uh, corporate profits have done very, very well, even with the current recession. But the price for working people has been high. Wage rates have stagnated even as hours of work have increased. Unemployment, even before the current crisis, was higher on average in the past 20 years before that than it had been during the 1945 to 73 period. Glaring inequalities of income and wealth have emerged, inequalities that have a variety of pernicious effects in regard to and measurable effects in regard to health, mortality, uh, educational attainment, and civic participation. One answer prominent in the boom years of the 1990s was that in view of the changing structure and technology of work, workers needed to reinvent themselves. The UAW assembly line worker was supposed to retrain as an IT expert. But in fact, such skill enhancement has proved of limited value to ordinary workers. The great majority of men and women displaced in the new economy have found little opportunity for high work to say a high wage to say nothing of secure and benefit providing employment asks journalist Future Kelly, training for what? Rather than a skills shortage, millions of Americans have more skills than their jobs require. And most job creation is for relatively low wage work. Hotel and restaurant workers, healthcare employees, temporary workers. Moreover, he adds, this trend is likely to continue. So our question, does the labor movement have a role in this new model uh, structure of employment? Can it advance its goals of achieving a more equitable, secure, and humane order in a more engaged and a more engaged and active citizenry. Greenhouse, the journal, the New York Times journalist, says, yes, it has to do this. It's necessary to insert the American worker back into the national conversation, but he warns it won't be easy. Prospects for the labor movement's resurgence rest largely on its ability to organize the service sector of the economy. During World War II and into the 1950s, the vast majority of wage earners toiled in manufacturing, construction, transport, and mining. Today, over 70% of those employed are employed in what we would call services. Even so, there are certain similarities between then and now, just in the, as in the 1930s and the 1940s. If it is to avoid drifting into irrelevance, the labor movement will once again have to reach out to a largely non-skilled an ethnically diverse labor force. The mission of today's labor movement, I got the right one on, yeah. The mission of today's labor movement is what it has always been, to improve the conditions of wage earners and their families, especially among those with limited career and, uh, and employment choices, and to promote the interests of working people in the political arena. Just as the New Deal and the CIO brought a degree of security, workplace due process, increased wages, and so-called fringe benefits to an earlier immigrant-based uh, generation of non-skilled workers, so a revitalized labor movement can improve the standards and circumstances of a new generation of custodial, food processing, healthcare, and clerical workers. And though you can offshore manufacturing of goods that the big box stores sell, you can't off offshore the stores themselves, nor can you farm out hospitals, retirement facilities, medical facilities, office buildings, extended care centers, entertainment complexes, and shopping malls that employ increasing numbers of low-wage workers, the majority of them people of color and or women. Think of what it would do to current gross in disparities in income and wealth if a million Walmart worker workers were to gain union standards. Fat chance, I know. Um, uh, the service sector, however, offers challenges that the uh, uh, 
challenges that the men of the 1930s and 40s did not face. Much of the labor force is comprised of women and people of color. Organizers must root themselves in communities and work with the clergy, with citizen activists. Um, uh, organizers are learning that service sector workers, nurses and teachers, for example, healthcare and assisted living workers care deeply about doing their jobs well. Thus, in addition to the traditional and still relevant, what we might call masculine concerns about wages, workplace discipline, job security, they may see the union as a means of more effectively helping the people they serve. This is, uh, has been, uh, uh, well, I got that one wrong. Um, this has been a recurrent theme in the expansion of organization among both professional workers, such as teachers and nurses, and among other personal service workers, such as home, home care workers, hospital workers, and uh, others in that sector of the economy. In the 1930s, CIO organizers devised innovative techniques. For example, the sit-down strike. This is one of the most important strikes in American history. Uh, these guys are occupying a GM plant in Flint, Michigan, 1937, as a way of bringing General Motors to the bargaining table. Uh, so uh, uh, the organizers of the 30s uh, did involve, uh, did devise innovative techniques. Success in the service sector, uh, uh, successes in the service sector have also featured a number of innovative strategies. One is the comprehensive campaign. If you have an employer who is resisting your efforts to organize the labor force, what you do is go after the employer in every way possible. Uh, set your lawyers to work looking for violations of safety codes, uh, sanitation codes, financial irregularities become such an annoyance, such a pain in the neck that the employer will eventually say, okay, I'd rather work with you than against you. I'll be neutral in your efforts to organize workers, and I'll recognize a card check of uh, desire for union membership. Um, a number of unions have done this, particularly in the service and um, uh, hotel and restaurant trades. Um, the organizers in the uh, service industry have enlisted the clergy and community leaders, particularly in ethnic and immigrant communities. Um, the uh, unions have become involved with the local community, uh, have uh, once again gone back to organizing from the grassroots up rather from organizer-driven top-down kinds of models. These formulas have been six, uh, successful in organizing low-wage service and clerical workers as reflected, for example, in the remarkable story of the 60,000 member culinary workers union, a restaurant workers union in Las Vegas. In the service uh, employees organization of home care workers in California and elsewhere, and in the same union's jobs with justice campaigns that have brought thousands of custodial workers into the union. In Florida, there's been a substantial organization among health care workers, many of them Haitian and other immigrants uh, through using these techniques. Um, there are a number of different um, initiatives going on, particularly on the state and local level. Uh, young people in particular, uh, the one I know best just because a student of mine is involved in it, something called Rock United, Restaurant Opportunity Center. Uh, these are uh, formed uh, in the wake of 9-11 uh, in helping restaurant workers in lower Manhattan to get new jobs, to recover from the devastation of 9-11, from the disruption of the economy. It's morphed into an organization of about 3,000 members that uh, provides legal services, that fights uh, sex and race discrimination suits, that works with cooperative restaurants to improve conditions, that uh, points out uh, uh, violations of, uh, and prosecutes violations of safety and uh, uh, wage standards and so on. Uh, and there are similar organizations around the country in a variety of places. There's, as I understand it, I couldn't, the web page didn't work, but a Rock United outfit in Maine. I don't know exactly where. Uh, so I say the web page didn't work. Um, even the old industrial workers of the world have become re revived in some places with younger workers taking on the old militant IWW rubric and organizing Jimmy John and uh, Starbucks workers in Minneapolis and in other cities as well. How promising are these initiatives? They do fly under the radar for the most part, um, and, and uh, they are, on the whole, uh, very, very local. Um, it's
it's hard to organize um, uh, major big box uh, outfits such as uh, Walmart and Target and others because in the old days, you know, you organized Flint, basically you organized General Motors. Uh, you organize a Walmart store and then there are 10,000 other Walmart stores. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult. Uh, labor activists and scholars disagree is what needs to be done. According to one model, uh, that embraced by the top AFL-CIO leadership, changes in the labor law are critical to organized labor's ability to rebound. Uh, where is it? Ah, there it is, okay. Um, its efforts have uh, centered on the doomed effort to gain passage of the Employee Free Choice Act which would have simplified union recognition procedures, promoted first contract uh, uh, resolution of differences, and would have stiffened penalties for labor law violators. Um, it looked like with the 60 members in the Senate and with a Democratic president, uh, EFCA, as it's called, the Employee Free Chase Act, the Choice Act, the first substantial revision in labor law since the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 uh, might have a chance of passage, but it was quickly uh, done to death in the, with the prospects of a Senate uh, filibuster. Other advocates argue that devoting substantial resources to changing labor law is a non-starter. Uh, even, um, even with a substantial Democratic majority and a Democratic president, hopes of passing EFCA were quickly shown to be an illusion. Workers, this strain of argument runs, must rely on their own resources. Organized labor must begin to function again as a movement, not as an organization, and to reach out to ethnic communities, people of faith, young activists, and other fair-minded citizens to develop uh, comprehensive campaigns to uh, bypass the counterproductive NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, and to compel employers uh, to stand aside and let workers decide themselves whether they want union representation or not. I'm certainly not in a position, I forget which hat I'm on, uh, I'm not in a position to tell labor activists which direction to move. The two approaches are not mutually exclusive. Certainly it took grassroots militancy, imaginative and resolute leadership, community allies and favorable changes in labor law and in the government to build the industrial union movement of the 30s and 40s. Um, what's at stake? A revitalized labor movement can be a potent force for a much needed downward distribution of income and for the promotion of a more egalitarian society. Moreover, it seems to me self-evident that, that an authoritarian or even a paternalistic workplace is an anomaly in a putatively democratic society. In the fight against apartheid in South Africa, we celebrated the role of the black unions in promoting democratic change. Um, we hailed the rise of solidarity, the Polish Workers' Union, in, in, ch in its challenge to the communist regime in Poland. As in those countries, so in the United States. In the, mind, in the words of, um, in, in the words of uh, Elaine Bernard, who is the director of the Harvard Trade Union Project, by bringing together workers who are isolated as individuals and often competing against each other, unions for a, forge a community in the workplace. They help workers understand that they have rights, and they provide a collective vehicle for exercising those rights. They provide a powerful check to the almost total power of management in the workplace, and they fight for the right of workers to participate in decision-making making in the workplace and in the larger community. I end with a dilemma, perhaps an irony. On the one hand, for the labor movement to carry forth the project of organizing the unorganized, it must gain greater political clout. But if, it, but if it is to expand its political influence, it must gain more members. Uh, political scientist Susan Orr asked this question, how long can the labor movement provide effective support for progressive public policies without expanding its organizational base? Historians, such as myself, uh, relish uh, dilemmas and ironies. It's, that's the fun of history, things are never easy and clear cut and they're complicated and work your way through them. So as a historian, I must say that I'm intri intrigued by these questions, this apparent dilemma. But as a union supporter, I find the challenge they pose troubling and perplexing. In some of the initiatives I've mentioned earlier, uh, I do find a, su a sustaining possibility. I do see a margin of hope. Thank you.
understand that um, and I can break away from this podium. I guess I'm first. Uh, I'm Vince Fury, and uh, you delivered a very interesting and astute history of the labor movement in the United States. And I'd be more interested in what you think the future of it is. And you cited 70% of all the union members are in the service. Oh, 70%. My impression is that most of those are in the public sector, municipalities, teachers, and state government. Um, and if that's the wrong impression, then please correct me on that score. And then lastly, um, would you kind of contrast or compare our labor situation with the rest of the uh, the world that we compete with. Uh, yeah, the first, the first one. I don't actually know the numbers. Um, uh, the number seventy percent is uh, for service workers covers a multitude of sins. Everything from college professors and brain surgeons all the way down to the people who scrub the floors and clean the laboratories and so on. Uh, I, by no means, do I think the majority of those are public employees. Uh, I don't have the figures. Somebody else may have. Uh, I would guess at least two-thirds of them are privately employed, I, I think. But I, I could be wrong, but I, I, but I think the substantial majority is privately employed. Um, these are people who work in hospitals, in uh, um, uh, nursing care homes, uh, retail clerks, a uh, uh, whole vast majority. Uh, Walmart itself, I think, uh, employs over a million people. Uh, so, I mean, so, so that's... That's the case. Uh, the um, the only the, the areas of six, there have been two primary areas of labor union success over the past 25 years or so, relative success. One has been with public employees, and something like about 37 percent of public employees, state, federal, national, are now union members, whereas only seven percent in the private sector of the economy. Uh, but so, so there, from the point of view, from the point of view, let's say, of a labor organizer eager to build the labor movement, but not knowing a lot about current situation, he or she would say, "Aha! The service sector is where I need to spend my time and effort and energy," and that's where the successes have been. I pointed to the uh, Los, uh, Los Angeles, uh, the culinary workers, the service employees union, uh, the uh, the. Uh, hotel and restaurant workers, there have been a number of successes, but uh, um, they've been shut out of other areas as well. As to comparing with the rest of the more or less industrialized world, I mean, it is true that wherever you look, pretty much, certainly in Britain, for example, whereas 25, what's the year, it's 2010? Um, let's go back 30 years ago, something like about 70% of British workers were union members. Today, it's down to 40%, and that's a sharp fall off. But it's still, it's a higher percentage in England, excuse me, Britain today, than it was at our peak in the 1950s. Um, France has a whole different pattern. France has never had, um, there may be people on any of these countries here no more than I do, so they can leap in. But uh, Fr France is well known for not having a particularly stable, organizationally coherent labor movement, but for having traditions of labor activism that flare up, as they have recently in France, uh, over cuts or over, uh, efforts to increase the uh, retirement age and cuts benefits and so on. Uh, in Germany, which is heavily organized uh, and heavily union, but in a whole different pattern of more or less cooperative labor relations and representation, if not through unions, at least through workers' councils on the boards of various uh, of the large corporations. The German economy has been doing very well with a high proportion of labor organization. So I don't know that there's one pattern, and there hasn't been in the past. Uh, the, the Canadian example is probably the most uh, 
relevant one to us today, their proportion of uh, organization has remained pretty much the same, even as I, ours has plummeted. In part, those people who point to labor law have a case when they point to Canada, because Canada has adopted, it, it's very, every province has its own labor laws. Uh, it's not as centrally directed, but a number of the provinces have developed uh, a card check as opposed to representation elections, and this makes unionization easier. So there are a variety of patterns. Uh, the general pattern has been for established unions to be in trouble in every country, but not as precipitously and not as uh, almost uh, 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 catastrophically as in the United States. Query, question. Oh, are you, uh, am I recognizing, or who recognizes? Yeah, I get to recognize. What I don't understand is why workers for private corporations don't want to be unionized. And, and not only do they not want to be unionized, but they apparently think they have to vote Republican, which appears to be voting for the boss, as opposed to voting for themselves. Uh, I'm, still, I'm still absorbing the results of the uh, recent elections myself. Uh, the, the evidence on the desire for union representation actually point in a different direction. Uh, the uh, most academic studies uh, show that uh, over 50 percent, depending on how you ask the question and in what context, uh, uh, people do say, yes, I would like to have union representation. Um, now, would you like to have union represent, uh, would you like to have union representation if it meant defying your boss and putting your job on the line. Well, no, I mean, not that, but but in, uh, things equal, sure, I'd like to have union representation. And that's where the problems of American labor law go into effect. Because, in, in fact, to start an organizing campaign, to be an activist, to try to establish a union in a private, you know, in a, uh, a private venue in the United States is really to take a big risk. Something so like 5% of people involved in organizing campaigns suffer some sort of disciplinary uh, action, including being fired. So it's job security as well as perhaps lack of leadership, would you say, uh, or not? W well, uh, I'm, I'm answering, right. your question originally was why don't people want to join right. unions, and my response is actually the evidence shows they do want to. They or at do least want to, and numbers. the reason, but but they don't want it to be a contentious, conflictual thing. But we in America are so used to it being that way. You want to form a union? You better be like Norma Ray and Jean Debs and John L. Lewis and be braver than anybody has a right to ask you to be brave, uh, rather than to say, I want to join a union? Yeah, well, vote here, sign up here. There is a debate among labor scholars about this. I mean, to some, some people, the right to join a union is a basic human right that is uh, no different than the right not to be discriminated on the basis of gender or race or disability or anything else. But we don't think of it that way. We think of it as a series of very difficult hurdles that have to be jumped over through a very complex legal procedure, and we think that's okay. I don't think it's okay, uh, but uh, it's the way things are done in this country. So the case was for the passage on the putting time and effort into the Employee Free Choice Act, which, and I will say in this case, where's my hat? I will say we, because I wrote some op-eds and I was active in my labor council and so on. I thought we had a good chance of having it passed. And what that would have done would have been to say, if you want to form a union, all you have to get is people to sign a card. Uh, that they want to join a union. You don't have to have an election. Now I know we're all Democrats, small d. We're all Democrats and we all like elections, but elections in the labor context are, uh, are almost fraudulent because one side has access to the electorate and the other side doesn't have access to the electorate. So again, I was in a sense challenging your premise, but I think you're right that uh, people are very concerned about job security. Uh, and that dissuades them from taking these risky steps. I certainly agree with that. And what was the other? Oh, is there a lack of leadership? Uh, yeah, and that's always the thing. I, I, don't, I, don't really, I don't really know about that. I, I think in some ways, um, uh, leaders like some of the people that I showed you, uh, I mean, Stern did a, a, a good job with SEIU and they did expand their membership and there were some imaginative campaigns and um, uh, my, Former student uh, Joey Brenner, who's organizing for SEIU, is very impressed with Mary Kay Henry and 
her ideas for expanding organization of SEIU. So I think there are some good leaders. I've met Trumpka, and I think he's a real smart guy and uh, uh, thoughtful and, uh, uh, you know, so, but it seems to me that um, the, the, the legal environment is uh, so difficult that it is, it is pretty hard. It's a combination of things. But then on the other hand, still, finally, it's a good question, how do we explain the voting behavior of working class citizens? And as I, I haven't seen detailed analysis of the last election, um, but it does appear that a majority of white working class voters uh, have been voting Republican pretty consistently over the past um, generation. Uh, but not working class voters generally, because of course many working class people are people of color. Uh, so it's a complicated, yeah, I, and I don't have an answer why people, apparently, the answer of the conservatives is, no, these are very shrewd people who see that their best hope for a better and more secure future is through the operations of the free market and getting rid of big government, and that's the way to do it, and that'll create more jobs. You know the guy you elected governor. That's what he was all about, as I understand it. Well, <laughs> you maniacs elected him. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, well, <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you, you mentioned that um, in the Alcoa, not the strike, but the Alcoa laid off 37,000 people. And there must have been a large group of managers as well as workers in that layoff. Do you envision a point where managers and workers will join the same union? Uh, see, here's the problem. I mean, it's a good point, and it's part of what I cut out because I saw that I was running you know, too long. Um, uh, right now, m people classified as management or supervisors, foremen and up, uh, are not permitted to join you. Or they're permitted to do anything they want. They're not. Uh, they're they're not permitted to uh, be covered by collective bargaining agreements. The Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 uh, uh, stipulated that management people in management are are not don't have the rights of collective bargaining, uh, uh, legally protected collective bargaining. Uh, I think one of the changes myself in labor law, if I had, you know, a veto-proof majority and so on, that would be a key, uh, uh, a key change that I would like to see made. There are a number of things wrong with American labor law, and one of them is that this artificial division between management and worker, which I think in many ways is increasingly, if not meaningless, at least attenuated in the American workplace, um, and also with contract workers. Uh, contract workers, don't, I mean, in other words, you, you fire everybody and then you hire people on individual contracts. They are not covered by labor law. They have no rights to collective bargaining. I would change those things. I would make it I would encourage the organization of people affected by the economy and uh, the structure of uh, work. Um, but they won't join the same unions now because they can't. They can't be part of the same union. Do um, unions in other countries have managers and workers in the same union? <clears throat> Good question. Uh, I'm not sure if I know the answer to it. I may probably in about three hours I'll think, oh, I, I knew more about that than I said. Uh, I think the uh, I'm trying to make up an answer and I, I can't quite. I'm trying to think the one, the labor movement I know most about uh, other than the American is the British labor movement. And I think in the British labor tradition, there's a pretty sharp separation between management and workers, and um, I, I don't, I don't think so. But I don't, I don't really know. I gotta say, and it's something that I'm gonna find out some more about. Apologize. Now, anybody got a question? I can't answer. I was just wondering. Um, at the end of your lecture, you'd mentioned that um, some of the 
labor leaders of today are mentioning how we need to have a new call for more political activism. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you could maybe expand on that a little bit, because we had been discussing, I, I interpreted that as having power, as in like a lobbying power, and the AARP are some of the biggest, I think it is one of the biggest lobbying yeah, powers you, on Washington. So. Actually, my, I had them, I didn't mention them, I had them on my list, 33 million, actually it's bigger now, that was a couple of years ago. Right. Yeah. So I didn't know if maybe there was more to that. Besides, well, I mean, I know there is, but. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, or, organized labor throughout American history and, you know, the modern history of the labor movement going back to the 1880s, let's say, uh, has always been involved in politics, both in political action and in lobbying and, uh, and, and so on. And in many ways, the labor movement today is more potent and more powerful and more influential as a political force than it is as a collective bargaining agent. Uh, the thing is that over the past, oh, 25 or 30 years, uh, the amount, and it's, a lot of it has to do with money, and the amount of money that labor has been able to devote to political, not only political action of electing that person and not that person, but what happens when you get into the committee rooms in Congress and in the state legislature, who has access, who gets listened to, uh, uh, corporations have vastly outspent the labor movement uh, over the past 30 years in particular. Uh, or corporate America up until roughly the 1970s pretty much uh, wasn't particularly involved. They were involved in you know, their particular industry. We want better tariffs. We want this or that. But as a kind of broad sort of force in lobbying activity. Um, uh, but that's grown enormously over the last 30 years. And so um, uh, organized labor is an important political force, but its relative weight has been diminished. I, I've talked to people who tell me about this. It used to be you'd pay sort of uh, legislators would say, yeah, the labor people would come in, I'd listen to them, and the business people would come in, and now they, well, the 18 corporate lawyers come in, and oh yeah, I got a little time for the guy from the machinist union, you know, like that. Uh, so political strength, and, and that's part of, to grow, it, it's the dilemma I ended with in a way, that it, uh, how do you grow the labor movement? Well, you need a more favorable political climate. How do you get a more favorable political climate by growing the labor movement? Because there is a close association between the strength of the labor movement and the election of more, for want of a better term, liberal government officials. So it's a dilemma that uh, that's your assignment for next week to uh, <laughs> solve. And I'll be very interested in your answer. Hi. Oh, yeah, hello. Uh, three of us here are from uh, the Maine Labor Movement. Oh, really? The Southern Maine Labor Council and- So uh, did uh, Kellen get in touch with you or anything like yes, that? Yes, he did. He's not here, obviously. Peter Kelman. Kelman. Right. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, he, he just had a hip replaced, I understand. Will you give my personal thanks for, I really do appreciate his, his help and bring you guys out. So uh, one of the things we've done in the Southern Maine Labor Council is to create uh, the Southern Maine Workers Center in an effort to broaden uh, people involved in uh, trying to organize or uh, sort of look at the labor movement in a new way. Uh, we were involved in Rock United and organizing uh, have rest you been, really? restaurant workers. Really? We had a little falling out with them, but uh, that's one of the things that happens with the labor movement. And, we, and certainly a lot of us think that we need a real social movement on the lines of uh, you know, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, and uh, labor movement of the 30s and sort of how one creates that is not easy. We've had some success in uh, uh, reaching out to the faith community who really helped us a lot in the last legislative session. And I'm saying all this is that we'd like to reach out to anyone here that would like to be part of our, our worker center. So uh, if you're so inclined, talk to some of them. That was uh, actually another part of my talk that I kind of cut out as the time got away from me. 
was some little discussion, at least, of worker centers that uh, starting in some of the bigger cities, but now moving to smaller communities, particularly in conjunction with people in the faith communities. Uh, other examples would be uh, living wage coalitions that have been springing up. Uh, uh, of all things, Florida has um, a higher minimum wage uh, for work in, uh, on, on uh, public work in Florida than the federal minimum wage because we passed a minimum wage, uh, excuse me, a living wage ordinance in Florida. Uh, you know, uh, that's impressive to me. <laughs> uh, and there have been something like, what, 140 living wage uh, uh, um, uh, uh, resolutions passed around the country and cities around the country, worker centers. Um, uh, there are a lot of things happening in the grassroots around. Uh, it's hard to see at this point what's going to pull those together into a politically coherent movement. And maybe we shouldn't even be asking that. Maybe we should be happy with a series of local, regional activities. Uh, I'll certainly be getting in touch with you, ask you a little more about how your labor council is involved with uh, Worker Center because it's something we probably should be doing in Gainesville University uh, the, the, uh, in, in, the, in our local labor movement. Um, I first of all just wanted to thank you for coming to share your expertise You're with us. And um, my question, I'm gonna, I hate to beat a dead horse, but um, I wanna go back to the, um, why are people reluctant to join yeah, labor sure. unions? Now, um, We've experienced kind of deja vu um, in the past couple of years with the recession, uh, the current recession, you know, and labor unions first gained so much popularity following the Great Depression. Um, I guess I'm wondering why with the current um, state of technology and whatnot and networking being so easy, why people are so still like unable to kind of join together to form labor unions? Um, it's, it's a good question. It's the $64 billion question, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, 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 w I will get around to responding to it. Let me share with you a sort of a personal kind of thing. Um, I'm an active member of my union. It's the United Faculty of Florida. We have collective bargaining rights with the state university system and the university campuses. And for about four years, I was the chair of the organizing committee. So it's a good, I'm a good person to ask because I was in charge of organizing the unorganized. Um, I don't think I did a very good job of it. Uh, I never really figured that out uh, exactly how to do it. Um, I guess I, I think I find myself as these questions come, um, and I didn't really think I thought this before, but I think I do now. Um, I, I guess I would put more emphasis than I would have thought on um, changes in labor law and um, trying to wrap our minds around this idea that the right to join a union is a basic human right that employers should have nothing to say about, much less hold captive audiences to feed workers anti-labor propaganda without uh, any kind of reciprocal obligation in behalf of the union. Uh, that outrages me. And uh, uh, so, so that I guess my best way into this would be to keep up the fight right now for uh, better labor law reform. But that's top down and it's not, it's not grassroots organizing as you're talking about, uh, you know, you folks are doing in the Portland uh, Labor Council. I guess, you know, in the 30s, what happened was you had better labor law and you had grassroots activism. How do you create grassroots militancy and activism? I don't really know how to do that. Um, uh, you see episodes of it. Uh, you see people. Um, uh, getting angry and turning to a union and then either winning or losing and then moving on. I, I guess I, I, I really don't, I don't have that key. But I, now, it is true that uh, the hotel and restaurant workers in, in, um, uh, in Las Vegas have been successful in generating a lot of rank and file activity and conveying the idea that this is a grassroots union, it works from the bottom up, uh, it pays attention to the concerns of the largely female and Hispanic 
um, uh, labor force in low wage, low training occupations. Um, it's, uh, it's been successful in that way. Some of the SEIU campaigns, uh, uh, Justice for Janitors, have been successful. Uh, maybe those are the best models to follow. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. That's about all I can say on that. But these guys. I, I would just add to that uh, that uh, it, it looks like a student over there and some students here, and it's great because I think you know one of the places to start is in the classroom because if under you know U.S. labor law today, if you were talking about forming a union at your in your classroom and your classroom was decided that it was a workplace, you couldn't talk about it on your in your classroom time. Basically, the First Amendment is suspended at the at the gate of the door, whether it's the factory door or the uh, uh, the school door. It doesn't matter because you or because you are you are you are you are, you are a captive thing. audience, yeah. and you can be fired. You can be fired from your position, any job. And as he said, tens of thousands of people are fired every year for the right to sit down and, and not even to vote on it to talk about it. And that's the, that's where the labor movement has gotten, and it's because of corporate. You know, the 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 somebody joked today that there's a new case in front of the Supreme Court for to get rid of class action suits. That now that they they had the Citizens United, which basically opened the torrents of corporate money that came in, and now they're talking about being able to get rid of class action suits by citizens. And somebody said, at this rate, corporations will be able to marry before gay people will be able to marry. <laughs> And yeah, I thought that was yeah. a great line. I mean, it's yeah, funny, but it's yeah. true because they have now they have citizenship now. I mean, they really do. They are considered they are considered they are considered uh, personalities. They really have they have all those rights. So I guess I would just say to, to students and other people is, is to talk about this issue because it got buried. That Employee Free Choice Act, it was disgusting. The kind of ads that the chambers of commerce and there's a few chambers of commerce that are standing up to it and 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 saying we don't want anything to do with the National Chamber of Commerce. Seattle, I think Washington and Seattle, there were some progressive communities that have done that. But more people aren't standing up day to day. You know, because all people are asking for is a chance to have some equality and to have a contract. God, I mean, you know, every Sears and Robux and every place wants to sell you a contract, sign a contract. But when you have to have a contract at the most important thing in your life, which you spend more time than anything else, they say, not only can you not have a contract, you can't talk about having a contract. It's crazy. So to point those things out, if students can point those things out, it's critical. The other thing that I would say is, is that, you know, even with, this, with the unemployment as it is, I happen to do unemployment appeals for, as a living now. I've been a union member all my life. Um, but it's incredible. I'll tell you, people were getting laid up. The same people getting laid up. They're managers and, and the, the lowest guy in the totem pole, the lowest woman on the totem pole. And guess what? They get the same amount of unemployment. And they get treated the same way in many cases from employers. Because everybody knows you're an employee at will, and uh, uh, and then when you get on top of that, so it, but at least within and it was it was uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal that brought unemployment, so people could actually have a chance to survive uh, when they lost their job. When you hear people now talking about the that uh, unemployment is unconstitutional, it's you know that's how far the political has swung so far that you can't even talk about it. So I'm just reiterating that. But I would say you know, tell every student to. To talk about this. Maybe the first uh, step uh, here, for again, assuming you guys are students, is uh, to agitate for the uh, University of New England to have a labor history and labor studies course. I don't think there is one yet, is there? <laughs> Should, shouldn't there be, you think? Yeah, University of Florida can have one. You guys can have one. Uh, well, he... Uh, well, uh, I could stay at Shea, Shea Patterson. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. I'd love to come up here in the summer huh? <laughs> and make me an offer. Uh. Hello. <laughs> Hi, my name's Rob. I, uh, I'm a professor at UNE, a history professor, and I actually do a lot of labor history in my classes. Yeah. And I'm a labor historian of Mexico. Yeah. Uh, Mexico, in the con it's written in the Constitution that uh, all workers have the right to strike. Um, in fact, many of the working class feel that they have a, a, a right to a job. Um, my question is related to, to not just Mexicans, but Latinos in general and immigrants in general. So many of our 
uh, service workers are in fact undocumented immigrants uh, working clandestinely in this country clandestinely. Do you see um, immigration reform as uh, a way perhaps to uh, empower uh, the, the working class in this country? Uh, it seems to me, it's, it's not an issue that I'm as fully up on as I ought to be, but it has seemed to me as the debate, particularly in light of the Arizona law, that the, and here it's sort of political, that the Democratic Party has really dropped the ball. Uh, as uh, I read a recent article that pointed out that, or argued that uh, the Democrats' um, uh, attitude toward immigration reform uh, runs the, the risk, their risk, of turning the uh, sort of uh, Hispanic Latino vote from a Democratic vote to a swing vote uh, because of their uh, uh, awkward and inconsistent and sometimes even hostile attitude toward undocumented immigrants. I think the um, uh, uh, I think it certainly is a mobilizing force, and I think we saw in the last election the power of the uh, Latino vote in the United States. And I think we saw in the most recent election what happens when people of color, both blacks and Latinos, don't turn out and aren't motivated to turn out and don't have the kinds of candidates and programs. So I, I would think, now I, on the whole, think that the AFL-CIO's notions about uh, Im immigrant reform have been pretty good. And they're trying to draw a line between, yes, we have to, we have to, the, the border has to be secure, uh, but there has to be a path to citizenship, uh, the human, that we have to recognize that undocumented workers put the emphasis on the fact that they're workers, not that they're undocumented. Uh, but in part, what the AFL-CIO's problem is, and I know this from personal experience and debates in our own Labor Council, um, it has to convince its own membership, its own non-Latino membership, including its black membership, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Latino, uh, immigrants are not a threat to the jobs of Americans. I, I don't think they are, um, but it's a tricky, uh, but it could be black and brown together with a more enlightened uh, Caucasian um, labor-informed um, working class, I think could pull together in a more permanent way the kind of coalition that emerged in 2006 and 2008. Um, so yeah, I think if handled right, and not just finessed, but really confronted, um, uh, uh, immigration reform could be a real positive for the more progressive uh, forces in American life.